Welcome. John, the Morgyle here. Going to do, what's up, OIC? Uh, going to do a audio book reading this morning from The Smoky God, Voyage to the Underworld. I've got that subtitle right. By Willis George Emerson. Uh, so if you can hear me loud and clear, well, it looks like y'all, we already got a couple of thumbs up in the chat. So as y'all pile in, uh, let me know you can hear me by giving a big thumbs up. Appreciate it. We're going to pick this one up right where we left off, uh, which is, so it's going to be chapter four. And here we go. Maybe. Yeah, that's not right. Sorry, I got to find chapter four again. Let me scroll down. It might take me just a minute. Come on, baby. We'll get there, I promise. Um, there we go. Part four uh, is going to be in the underworld. I guess just real quick before I get started, uh, it's just sending a prayer up for everybody out there in, uh, in Gaza on both sides of the border, the Israelis and the Palestinians over there. Prayers go up for them. I just hope that everybody stays safe and you know, I, I pray that the, the Most High Creator works miracles in open and in secret to, uh, you know, soften the hearts of the leaders, uh, work miracles to save innocent lives, uh, work miracles to bring justice where justice is needed and deserved. And, um, you know, just as sort of a, I would say a warning to Anybody that's encroaching on desperate, say, cornered animal type situation. So if you're like encroaching on a cornered animal, uh, you definitely want to be careful, uh, especially when that cornered am uh, animal can potentially uh, stack hundreds of tons of TNT or equivalent in one place in order to replicate the effects of what the normal vernacular would call like a nuclear bomb, right? Because when I mean, you guys know me and my position on the whole nuclear bomb thing, but I do know that pretty much anybody with the money can uh, put to, you know, hundreds of tons of TNT or C4 in one place. And basically you, you've got what is the equivalent of a megaton nuclear bomb, right? And, you know, just wouldn't it be convenient to the narrative and convenient to the unstabilization of the Middle East if, say, hypothetically, um, as Israel's entire armed forces was like basically decimated and wiped out in a single instant, right? I'm not saying that's going to happen, but if something like that did happen, it would play into the narrative that... Um, you know, the whole thing with nuke bombs. So anyway, looks like we're lo we're losing viewers. I know y'all didn't necessarily tune into the audio book to talk about Mo Gaza. So we'll get into it. Just wanted to get that out there. So, you know, y'all be careful. Prayers go up to the to the people on both sides of that for real, for real, though. All right. Part four in the underworld. <clears throat> We learned that the males do not marry before they are from 75 to 100 years old, and that the age at which women enter wedlock is only a little less, and that both men and women frequently live to be from six to 800 years old, and in some instances, much older still. 
Um, there's a footnote here. Going to skip that. Maybe at the end of the whole book, I'll go through and read all the footnotes. Maybe not. I don't know. Um, during the following year, we visited many villages and towns, prominent among them being the cities of Nige, Delphi, Hectia, and my father was called upon no less than a half dozen times to go over the maps, which had been made from the rough sketches he had originally given the division of land and water on the outside surface of the earth. I remember hearing my father remark that the giant race of people in the land of the smoky god had almost as accurate an idea of the geography of the outside surface of the earth as had the average college professor in Stockholm. In our travels, we came to a forest of gigantic trees near the city of Delphi. Had the Bible said there were trees towering over 300 feet in height and more than 30 feet in diameter growing in the Garden of Eden, the Ingersolls, the Tom Paines, and Voltaires would doubtless have pronounced the statement a myth. Yet, this is the description of the California Sequoia Gigantea, but uh, these California giants pale in significance when compared to the forest Goliaths found within the continent, where about, uh, I'm sorry, where abound mighty trees from 800 to 1,000 feet in height and from 100 to 125 feet in diameter, countless in numbers and forming forests extending hundreds of miles back from the sea. The people are exceedingly musical and learned to a remarkable degree in their arts and sciences, uh, especially geometry and astronomy. And I guess that was learned. Okay, sorry about that. The internet here crapped out for a moment. I had to re-sign into the Wi-Fi here. So looks like we're good. Um, there are seven of you here now. If you don't mind, let's get let's get a couple thumbs up there to make sure. Oh, and we lost everybody. Well, crap balls. Well, we're back anyway. Um, okay, so. Uh, the people are exceedingly musical and learned to a remarkable degree in their arts and sciences, especially geometry and astronomy. Their cities are equipped with vast palaces of music where not infrequently as many as the 25,000 lusty uh, voices of this giant race swell forth in mighty choruses of the most sublime symphonies. The children are not supposed to attend institutions of learning before they are 20 years old. Then their school life begins and continues for 30 years. Ouch. 10 of which are uniformly devoted uh, by both sexes to the study of music. Their principal vocations are architecture, agriculture, horticulture, the raising of vast herds of cattle, and the building of conveyances peculiar to that country for travel on land and water. You know, extracurriculars, right? Stuff you could never use in a million years. No, I'm kidding. Um, by some device, which I cannot explain, they hold communion with one another between the most distant parts of their country uh, on air currents. Hmm. All buildings are erected with special regard to strength, durability, beauty, and symmetry, and with a style of architecture vastly more attractive to the eye than any I have ever observed elsewhere. About three-fourths of the inner surface of the earth is land, and about one-fourth is water. There are numerous rivers of tremendous size some flowing in a northerly direction and others southerly. Uh, it does remind one of the, um, there's a Mercator map um, that he did, which is just of the central north, apparently, or, you know, ostensibly. Uh, and it's just as they, they describe here. 
where you've got the magnetic mountain in the middle and then four inflowing rivers. And uh, you guys may have heard of Gerardus Mercator, you know, of uh, <laughs> a cylindrical conformal map fame, right? Okay. Uh, rivers of tremendous size, some flowing in a northerly direction and others southerly. Uh, some of these rivers are 30 miles in width, and it is out of these vast waterways at the extreme northern and southern parts of the inside surface of the earth in regions where low temperatures are experienced that fresh ice, uh, freshwater icebergs are formed. Sorry. Uh, they are then pushed out to sea like huge tongues of ice by the abnormal uh, freshets of turbulent waters that twice every year sweep everything before them. We saw innumerable specimens of bird life, no larger than those encountered in the forests of Europe or America. It is well known that during the last few years, entire species of birds have quit the earth or gone extinct. A writer in, recent article, in a recent article on this subject says, it is not possible that these disappearing bird species quit their habitation without and find an asylum in the within world. Whether inland among the mountains or along the seashore, we found bird life prolific. Oh, end quote, right? Uh, prolific. When they spread their great wings, some of the birds appeared to measure uh, at 30 feet from tip to tip. They are of a great variety and many colors. We were permitted to climb up on the edge of a rock and examine a nest of their eggs, where uh, there were five in the nest, each of which was at least two feet in length and 15 inches in diameter. After we had been in the city of Hectia about a week, Professor Galdia took us to an inlet where we saw thousands of tortoises along the sandy shore. I hesitate to state the size of these great creatures. They were from 25 to 30 feet in length, from 15 to 20 feet in width, and fully seven feet in height. When one of them, is, uh, when one of them projected its head, it had the appearance of some hideous sea monster. The strange conditions within are favorable not only for vast meadows of luxuriant grasses, forests of giant trees, and all manner of vegetable life, but wonderful animal life as well. One day we saw a great herd of elephants. There must have been 500 of these thunder-throated monsters with their restlessly waving trunks. They were tearing huge bows from the trees and trampling smaller growth into the dust like so much hazel brush. They would average over 100 feet in length and from 75 to 85 feet in height. It seemed as I gazed upon this wonderful herd of giant elephants that I was again living in the public library at Stockholm, where I had spent so much time studying the wonders of the Miocene, uh, uh, Miocene age. I was filled with mute astonishment and my father was speechless with awe. He held my arm with a protecting grip as if feel, uh, fearful of harm overtaking us. We were but two atoms in this great forest and fortunately unobserved by this vast herd of elephants as they drifted on and away, following a leader as does a herd of sheep. They browsed from growing herbage which they encountered as they traveled and now and again shook the firmament with their deep bellowing. There is a hazy mist that goes up from the land each evening, and it variably rains once every 24 hours. 
this great moisture and the invigorating electrical light and warmth account uh, perhaps for the luxuriant vegetation while the highly charged electrical air and the evenness of climatic conditions may have much to do with the giant growth and longevity of all animal life. In places, the level valleys stretched away for many miles in every direction. The smoky god in its clear white light looked calmly down. There was an intoxication in the electrically surcharged air which fanned the cheek as softly as a vanishing whisper. Nature chanted a lullaby in the faint murmur of winds whose breath was sweet with the fragrance of a bud and blossom. After having spent considerably more than a year in visiting several of the many cities of the within uh, and a great deal of intervening countryside, and more than two years had passed from the time we had been picked up by the great excursion ship on the river, we decided to cast our fortunes once more upon the sea and endeavor to regain the outside surface of the earth. We made known our wishes and they were reluctantly but promptly followed. Our hosts gave my father at his request various maps showing the entire inside surface of the earth, its cities, oceans, seas and rivers, gulfs and bays. They also generously offered to give us all the bags of gold nuggets, some of them as large as a goose's egg, that we're, we were willing to attempt to take with us in our little fishing boat. In due time, we returned to Jehu, at which place we spent one month in fixing up and overhauling our little fishing sloop. After all was in readiness, the same ship, Naz, that originally discovered us, took us on board and sailed to the mouth of the river Hedekel. After our giant brothers had launched our little craft for us, they were most cordially regretful at parting and evinced much um, solicitude for our safety. My father swore by the gods Odin and Thor that he would surely return again within a year or two and pay them another visit. And thus we bade them adieu. We made ready and hoisted our sail, but there was little breeze. We were becalmed within an hour after our giant friends had left us and started on their return trip. The winds were constantly blowing south. That is, they were blowing from the northern opening of the earth to uh, toward that which we knew to be south, but which, according to our compasses, pointing finger was directly north. For three days, we tried to sail and to beat against the wind, but to no avail. Whereupon my father said, my son, to return by the same route as we came in is impossible at this time of year. I wonder why we did not think of this before. We have been here almost two and a half years. Therefore, this is the season when the sun is beginning to shine at the southern opening of the earth. The long cold night is on the Spitsbergen country. What shall we do, I inquired. There is only one thing we can do, my father replied, and that is to go south. Accordingly, he turned the craft about, gave it full reef, and started by the compass north, but in fact, directly south. The wind was strong, and we seemed to have struck a current that was running with remarkable swiftness in the same direction. In just 40 days, we arrived at Delphi, a city we had visited in company with our guides, Jules Galdia and his wife, near the mouth of the Gihon River. Here, we stopped for two days and were most hospitably entertained by the same people who had welcomed us on our former visit. Uh, we laid in some additional, we laid in some additional provisions and again set sail following the needle due north. On our outward trip, we came through a narrow channel, which appeared to be a separating body of water between two considerable bodies of land. There was a beautiful beach to our right, and we decided to reconnoiter. 
Casting anchor, we waded ashore to rest up for a day before continuing the outward hazardous undertaking. We built a fire and threw on some sticks of dry driftwood. While my father was walking along the shore, I prepared a tempting repast from supplies we had provided. There was a mild, luminous light, which my father said resulted from the sun shining in from the south aperture of the earth. That night, we slept soundly and awakened the next morning as refreshed as if we had been in our own beds at Stockholm. After breakfast, we started out on an inland tour of discovery, but had not gone far when we sighted some birds, which we recognized at once as belonging to the penguin family. They are flightless birds, but excellent swimmers and tremendous in size. With white breast, short wings, black head, and long peaked bills, they stand fully nine feet high. They looked at us with little surprise and presently waddled rather than walked toward the water and swam away in a northerly direction. The events that occurred during the following hundred or more days beggar description. We were on an open and iceless sea, the month we reckoned to be November or December, and we knew the so-called South Pole was turned towards the sun. Therefore, when passing out and away from the internal electrical light of the smoky god and its genial warmth, we would be met by the light and warmth of the sun shining in through the uh, south opening of the earth. We were not mistaken. There were times when our little craft driven by wind that was continuous uh, and persistent shot through the waters like an arrow. Indeed, had we encountered a hidden rock or obstacle, our little vessel would have surely been crushed into kindling. At last, we were conscious that the atmosphere was growing decidedly colder, and a few days later, icebergs were sighted far to the left. My father argued, and correctly, that the winds which filled our sails came from the warm climate within. The time of the year was certainly most auspicious for us to make our dash for the outside world, and attempt to scud our fishing sloop through open channels of the frozen zone which surrounds the polar regions. We were soon amid the ice packs and how our little craft got through the narrow channels and escaped being crushed, I know not. The compass behaved in the same drunken and unbearable fashion in passing over the southern curve or edge of the Earth's shell as it had done in our inbound trip at the northern entrance. It gyrated, dipped, and seemed like a thing possessed. One day, as I was lazily looking over the sloop's side into the clear waters, my father shouted, Breakers ahead! Looking up, I saw through a lifting mist a white object that towered several hundred feet, uh, completely shutting off our advance. We lowered sail immediately and none too soon. In a moment, we found ourselves wedged between two monstrous icebergs. Each was crowding and grinding against its fellow mountain of ice. They were like two small g gods of war contending for supremacy. We were greatly alarmed. Indeed, we were between the lines of a battle royale. The sonorous thunder of the grinding ice was like the continued volleys of artillery. Blocks of ice, larger than a house, were frequently lifted up a hundred feet by the mighty force of lateral pressure. They would shudder and rock to and fro for a few seconds, and then come crashing down with a deafening roar and disappear into the foaming waters. Thus, for more than two hours, this contest of the icy giants continued. It seemed as if the end had come for us. The ice pressure was terrific, 
And while we were not caught in the dangerous part of the jam and were safe for the time being, yet the heaving and rending of tons of ice as it fell, splashing here and there into the watery depths, filled us with shaking fear. Finally, to our great joy, the grinding of the ice ceased, and within a few hours, the great mass slowly divided, and, as if an act of providence had been performed, right before us lay an open channel. Should we venture with our little craft into this opening? If the pressure came on again, our little sloop as well as ourselves would be crushed into nothingness. We decided we must take the chance and accordingly hoisted our sail to a favoring breeze and soon started out like a racehorse, running the gauntlet of this unknown narrow channel of open water. Okay, so that's end of part four. We'll go ahead and do part five, Among the Ice Packs. Uh, for the next 45 days, our time was employed in dodging icebergs and hunting channels. Indeed, had we not been favored with a strong south wind and a small boat, I doubt if this story could have ever been given to the world. At last, there came a morning when my father said, my son, I think we are to see home. We're almost through the ice. See, the open water lies just before us. However, there were a few icebergs that had floated far northward into the open water still ahead of us on either side, stretching away for many miles. Directly in front of us and by the compass, which had now righted itself due north, there was an open sea. What a wonderful story we have to tell the people of Stockholm, continued my father, while a look of pardonable elation lighted up on his honest face. And think of all the gold nuggets stowed away in the hold. I spoke kind words of praise to my father, not alone for his fortitude and endurance, but also for his courageous daring as a discoverer and for having made the voyage that now promised a successful end. I was grateful, too, that he had gathered the wealth of gold we were carrying home. While congratulating ourselves on the goodly supply of provisions and water we still had on hand, and on the dangers we had escaped, we were startled by hearing a most terrific explosion caused by the tearing apart of a huge mountain of ice. It was deafening, like a roar, like the firing of a thousand cannons. We were sailing at the time with great speed and happened to be near a monstrous iceberg, which to all appearances was as immovable as a rock-bound island. It seemed, <clears throat> it seemed, however, that the iceberg had split and was breaking apart where upon the balance of the monster along which we were sailing was destroyed and it began uh, dipping from us. My father quickly anticipated the danger before I realized its awful possibilities. Uh, the iceberg extended down into the water many hundreds of feet and as it tipped over, the portion coming up out of the water caught our little fishing craft like a lever on a fulcrum and threw it into the air as if it had been a football. Our boat fell back on the iceberg that by this time had changed the side next to us for the top. My father was still in the boat, having become entangled by the rigging. I was thrown some 20 feet away. I quickly scrambled to my feet and shouted to my father who answered, all is well. Just then a realization dawned upon me. Horror upon horror, the blood froze in my veins. 
the iceberg was still in motion and its great weight and force and toppling over would cause it to submerge temporarily. I fully realized what a sucking maelstrom it would produce amid the worlds of water on every side. They would rush into the depression in all their fury like white fanged wolves eager for human prey. In this supreme moment of mental anguish, I remember glancing at our boat, which was lying on its side, and wondering if it could possibly right itself, and if my father could escape. Was this the end of our struggles and adventures? Was this death? All these questions flashed through my mind in the fraction of a second, and a moment later I was engaged in a life and death struggle. The ponderous monolith of ice sank below the surface and the frigid waters gurgled around me in frenzied anger. I was in a saucer with the waters pouring in on every side. A moment more and I lost consciousness. When I partially recovered my senses and roused from the swoon of a half-drowned man, I found myself wet, stiff, and almost frozen, lying on the iceberg. But there was no sign of my father or of our little fishing sloop. The monster berg had recovered itself and, with its new balance, lifted its head perhaps 50 feet above the waves. The top of this island of ice was a plateau, perhaps half an acre in extent. I loved my father well and was grief-stricken at the awfulness of his death. I railed at fate that I too had not been permitted to sleep with him in the depths of the ocean. Finally, I climbed to my feet and looked about me. The purple domed sky above, the shoreless green ocean beneath, and only an occasional iceberg discernible. My heart sank in hopeless despair. I cautiously picked my way across the berg toward the other side, hoping that our fishing craft had righted itself. Dared I think it possible that my father still lived? It was but a ray of hope that flamed up in my heart, but the anticipation warmed my blood uh, in my veins and started it rushing like some rare stimulant through every fiber in my body. I crept close to the precipitous side of the iceberg and peered far down, hoping, still hoping. Then I made a circle of the berg, scanning every foot of the way, and thus I kept going around and around. One part of my brain was certainly becoming maniacal, while the other part, I believe, and due to this day, was perfectly rational. I was conscious of having made the circuit a dozen times, and while one part of my intelligence knew, in all reason, there was not a vestige of hope, yet some strange, fascinating aberration bewitched and compelled me still to beguile myself with expectation. The other part of my brain seemed to tell me that while there was no possibility of my father being alive, yet if I quit making the circuit, uh, the circus pilgrimage, if I paused for a single moment, it would be acknowledgement of defeat. And should I do this, I felt that I should go mad. Thus, hour after hour, I walked around and around, afraid to stop and rest yet physically powerless to continue much longer. Oh, the horror of horrors, to be cast away in this wide expanse of waters without food or drink and only a treacherous iceberg for an abiding place. My heart sank within me and all semblance of hope was fading into black despair. Then the hand of the deliverer was extended and the death-like stillness of a solitude rapidly becoming unbearable was suddenly broken by the firing of a signal gun. I looked up in startled amazement, and when I saw, less than a half a mile away, a whaling vessel bearing down towards me with her full set. 
Evidently, my continued activity on the iceberg had attracted their attention. On drawing near, they put out a boat and, descending cautiously to the water's edge, I was rescued and a little later lifted on board the whaling ship. I found it was a Scotch whaler, the Arlington. She had cleared from Dundee in September and started immediately for the Antarctic in search of whales. The captain, Angus McPherson, seemed kindly disposed, but in matters of discipline, as soon as I learned, possessed of an iron will. When I attempted to tell him that I had come from the inside of the earth, the captain and mate looked at each other, shook their heads, and insisted on my being put in a bunk under strict surveillance of the ship's physician. I was very weak for want of food and had not slept for many hours. However, after a few days rest, I got up one morning and dressed myself without asking permission of the physician or anyone else and told them that I was as sane as anyone. The captain sent for me and again questioned me concerning where I had come from and how I came to be alone on an iceberg in the far off Antarctic Ocean. I replied that I had just come from the inside of the earth and proceeded to tell him how my father and myself had gone in by the way of Spitsbergen and had come out by the way of South Pole country, whereupon I was put in irons. I afterward heard the captain tell the mate that I was as crazy as a March hare and that I must remain in confinement until I was rational enough to give a truthful account of myself. Finally, after much pleading and many promises, I was released from the irons. And then, then and there, I decided to invent some other story that would satisfy the captain and never again refer to my trip to the land of the smoky god, at least until I was safe on land and among friends. Within a fortnight, I was permitted to go about and take my place as one of the seamen. A little later, the captain asked me for an explanation. I told him that my experience had been so horrible that I was fearful of my memory and begged him to permit me to leave this question unanswered until some time in the future. I think you're recovering considerably, he said but you are not sane yet by any good deal. Uh, permit me to do such work as you may assign, Oh, I replied, and if it does not compensate you sufficiently, I'll pay you immediately after I reach Stockholm, to the last penny. Thus the matter rested. On finally reaching Stockholm, as I have already related, I found that my good mother had gone to her reward more than a year earlier. I have also told how later the treachery of a relative landed me in a madhouse where I remained for 28 years, seemingly unending years. And still later, after my release, how I returned to the life of a fisherman following it uh, sedulously for 27 years, then how I came to America and finally to Los Angeles, California. But all this can be of little interest to the reader. Indeed, it seems to me the climax of my wonderful travels and strange adventures was reached when the Scotch sailing vessel took me from the iceberg on the Antarctic Ocean. All right, so we will uh, leave it there with the end of part five. There is a conclusion. Now let's see how much longer, how many more pages is it? Oh, there's a whole nother part. Yeah, so we'll leave this for the next section. Um, we're almost at 40 minutes. So, uh, yeah, interesting story so far. Um, for y'all, just so y'all know, I'm working on a uh, pretty extensive, and I think it's going to be a real good, uh, like a mud flood, uh, Tartaria stolen history, uh, questioning the historical narrative type video. So that's in the works. I should have that hopefully done this week, but it's going to be, at least an hour or two long one, so should be good. I'm gonna gonna be focusing on Chicago and, and some of the uh, official narrative of Chicago. What's up, C Lightning, DJ Slims? All right, 
Well, uh, thanks so much for joining for this audiobook reading. And I, I may be also doing another live stream today uh, for something else different, but uh, I'll keep you all posted. I'll put an event up a couple hours ahead of time if I do go live. And um, don't forget to subscribe, like, share, all that good stuff. Love you guys very much. And I will see you in the next one. All right, take care.